Philippians chapter 2, since we haven't been there in a while, had a little break here, conference break, which wasn't a break at all, but a massive coronary, but uh, Jesus was glorified and we're all back to normal, right? <laughs> well, sort of. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and start at verse 5, and let's just reread for the purposes of remembering. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> All right, so uh, you'll notice again, verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, or, or uh, the original Greek is a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with, with God, but made himself of no reputation, or... That's where the word kenosis is at. Verse 7, he emptied himself. And um, <clears throat> uh, this, this thought of uh, not thinking it robbery to be equal with God, not thinking it a thing to be grasped after <clears throat> to be equal with God. It's important because Jesus is God, he was God, he is God, he will be God, and when you consider the Godhead, and I'm going to, surely this can be seen on the board, this is kenosis number 11, um, you know, my measurements here are not going to be adequate enough, but... Just trying to, uh, and of course there we go, see. <laughs> Just trying to show the Godhead in the form of uh, three equal rectangles, <clears throat> as equal as I can get them. Um, if they were exact, you would have the Father and one representing one, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these. Uh, by drawing equal rectangles and then a circle around all three of them, meaning it's all God, but there is equality within the Godhead because they are one. Um, Jesus, thinking it not something to grasp after, to be equal, exactly equal with God. <clears throat> but emptied himself. All, right. now, all of that is just incredibly important because what you have here is the second person of the Trinity as it were checking out on being equal with God. I just put an X through the Son in the sense of He's leaving this equality of exact measurement. <clears throat> and it says what it, that, that the thought, the thought in what he's about to do and, and, and that is behind it is, the thought behind it is that he doesn't think it a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God, but made himself of no or emptied himself and took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So, let's put the sun down here and let's put him, uh, let, we're going to have to do a little different picture here. So I'm going to draw Jesus as a full-bodied man instead of a stick figure and he, he looks so holy. There. He, he Jesus didn't think, now we're talking about 
him in his own being, didn't think it a thing to be grasped after to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. He emptied himself of all those things that were important, and he was made in the fashion of a man. Okay, do you see the progression there? There's a thought, and then there's an act. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself, uh, he emptied himself, and here's, the, here's the, the important fact of that. When he did that, he made himself a vessel of God, the Father. He didn't take on a vessel for the Son. He became the vessel of the Father. Does that make sense? Let's go to the Gospel of John and uh, look at just a few verses there. And there are many in John, but we're just going to look at a few here. Gospel of John chapter 12. <clears throat> and let's look at verse 44. John 12, 44. <clears throat> Jesus cried out and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me, and, him that, and he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. <clears throat> All right. We'll, we'll read a couple other scriptures that will help clarify and quantify that but the basic thing that he's saying is that if you believe on me you actually don't believe on me you're believing on the one that sent me okay you for that now here's 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 what we in our mind because we are corporal entities separate from everybody else we live in our own body. We do everything ourselves. We don't comprehend Jesus' explanations of things because he's not corporal in the sense of he lives in his own body. The Father lives in his body. So when he says to us, here's how we get it. When he says to us, if he that believes on me believes on him that sent me, and he that seeth me seeth him that sent me, you would separate the, the sender from the one who is sent, and then you would say, okay, well, then I, if I see you, then I'm seeing the one that sent me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Two separate beings, the sender uh, and the one being sent, and we see a separation there. But the one that sent Jesus was God the Father who dwells in him. And Jesus is saying, if you see me, you've, sent the, you've seen the one who sent me. Does that make sense? Well, if that doesn't, I'll give you some more scriptures that do. Uh, verse, um, also, let's just read verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Okay, now let's flip over to chapter 14. And uh, <clears throat> verse 7 If you have known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. And here's what he means. Well, let's, let's, let's ask a question before we answer it. What does he mean from henceforth? What does he mean from henceforth you know you know, you from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Why, what magically happened there that they're going, well, we want to see the Father, we want to know the Father, and Jesus says, well, don't worry, from henceforth you do. What, you know, I mean, does anybody find it uh, Questioning in your being where you want to ask questions so that you can actually figure out what Jesus is saying instead of understanding a few things 
and applying it to everything else when it, it doesn't apply. <clears throat> Jesus here is speaking of the most fundamental reality that will guide true Christianity. It is fundamental to his being as a man, walking as a man on earth. It is fundamental to man because it's fundamental to God and always was before God ever created anything else. It is the foundation of all things. And if we don't get it, then we just hear Jesus speak in words and we go, you know, that's the King James Bible. I don't fully get it. You know, well, you can read a modern day translation of it and not get it if the Holy Spirit doesn't open your eyes to the, as I said, the fundamental truth of the Godhead. So he says... If you had known me, you should, have, you should have known my father. Because why? Well, Philip, say, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it suffices us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the father. And how sayest thou then, show us the father? All right. Jesus is questioning back. He's saying, I, have I been a long time with you and you still don't know me? Now this is Jesus' definition of this new kind of man, the only begotten, the only one of his kind. His definition of me, speaking of himself, not me, but himself, me. His definition of me, have you not known me, is it's the Father in me. It's not me. And again, remember, when they accused him of doing things on the Sabbath, this is John chapter 5, when they accused Jesus of doing miracles on the Sabbath, he didn't, that wasn't the place where he said, what do you mean the Sabbath's for us and we're for the Sabbath? He didn't get into all of the wine dangling of theology and technical aspects. He simply said, I didn't do it. My father did it. It's just that simple to him. It's just that simple. I'm a vessel. I don't have to be equal with God, so I didn't do it. It's the Father that is inside of me, and I am his vessel, and the true definition of me is the Father in me. The true comprehension of me is not to comprehend me, except to com comprehend me as a vessel, but the true comprehension of me is the Father in me, just as the true comprehension of us is Christ in you, or should be. It, and, and here's the important thing. That's how we should define ourselves. What did you do in your BC days? What did you do last week? What failures did you do? I don't even care. What I care about is exactly what God says about you. And he says you're dead. And Christ is your life. And that is your definition or it's not your definition and if it's not your definition the definition you have of you is not based on death burial and resurrection <clears throat> all right so <clears throat> jesus and that's where he said have i been so long with you and yet hast thou not known me he that has seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? <clears throat> All right, let's go back to this thing where Jesus says, from henceforth. Okay, up to this point, clearly they didn't get it. They didn't understand kenosis. They didn't understand that he emptied himself, that he wasn't just God in the flesh. It was God in the flesh, but it wasn't the Son 
in the flesh. It was the Father in his flesh. The Father dwelt in him. The Father did the works. Jesus said, the works I do are not my own, they're the Father. The words I speak are not my own, they're the Father's. And so they, they up to this point, didn't get it. Okay? So Jesus is saying, right now, he's, he's defining it. He's saying, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Okay? If you knew me, you would know. And what is his definition of that statement? His definition is what we've been talking about. His definition is because I'm not doing this stuff the Father is, and he's living in me and doing it through me. All right. So he's, in his mind and in his understanding, he just explained to them this understanding of how this all works. God's not empowering a man in the sense of what we think. Uh, the man is in there and God empowers him. No, God empties out, you know, God does a root canal on you. He pulls out the root which was you and he fills it with his son. Pure gold. You don't believe it? I got several of them. <laughs> That's what he does. Okay? And in Jesus' mind in verse 7, he explained it. They should have gotten it. You don't, you, you, you hear me saying this, maybe you don't believe what I'm saying. I'm telling you the truth. That was his explanation, and they should have gotten it, and here's the proof of it. If you had known me, you should have known my Father, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. In other words, from this moment on, that's the truth that you're supposed to go by. I have emptied myself. I am in, the pro I am in a process called kenosis, and where I, by, it's not me. I have step down from equality with God and became the vessel of God. I have become the true understanding of what mankind was meant from the very beginning. I am the explanation. I am the prototype. I am the only begotten at this stage, but I am man. The way man was meant to be. All right, so he says, from henceforth, from now on, from henceforth, you know him. Okay, how are we going to know him? If we get what Jesus says, how are we going to know him? We're going to know him as the life in the vessel. We're going to be able to see Jesus as the vessel, and we're going to be able to see the Father as the source, as the life, as the filling. And, <clears throat> all right. So in Jesus' mind, when he says, from henceforth you know him, now, folks, this is important because he speaks to us all the time. <laughs> he speaks to us all the time and tells us stuff. And he thinks we get it because he talks to us. He goes, look, here's the deal, da-da-da-da. Do you get it? And anybody remember places in the Bible where they go, oh, yeah, we, now we understand. And, you know, that was later on, and Jesus is looking at him going, did you hardly ever get what I say? But here, he really, truly thought that they got it. And so he goes, from henceforth, this is your definition of me. This is your definition of the Father. Next verse, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices thus. Jesus would say, I said in the last verse, from henceforth. That means that verse 8, Philip, is you're not supposed to be speaking that now, after this point. That should be like verse 6. Because henceforth, you have lined up with me, but they didn't line up with him, and they asked a dumb question, okay, Show us the Father. We need to see this. We don't get this kenosis thing. We don't understand. Show us. Je and Jesus' response is, Have I been such a long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Does that sound like somebody that's like uh, maybe a little upset because they didn't get verse 7, 
and now he's having to say verse 9. Okay. Now, let's, let's give the Son of God a little more credit over Philip. Let's at least say that Jesus said, okay, look, this is the way I've always lived, even in the Godhead. Okay? Uh, but you've never lived that way. You don't think that way. You don't use definitions the way we do. So let me see if maybe I can be a little more clear in this. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So no longer say from henceforth, show us the Father. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, it does. The proof of that is the very next verse that Jesus, that the Godhead, that the Father, that the Son, that the Holy Spirit, they're used to this thing of not being independent. There's not three gods. There's one God. And they're not independent of one another. Verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Can I get any more plain? Is that? What is that? We got a train going by outside. <clears throat> All right, so Jesus just gave the explanation. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Right there is the explanation of the Godhead. Right there is the explanation of what God is like. God is three in one. But wait a minute. See, our definition of three in one is to draw three and then put them in one. But he said... Here's three, like a cluster of grapes. I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. And later on, he says the same thing about the Spirit. And there is this dwelling in and through one another, so that you are both vessel and source in the Godhead. Do you understand what I just said? You're both vessel and source. When you're dwelling in, you are source. When they're dwelling in you, you are vessel. There is a constant flow of submission and of being brought forth honorably is the only way I know how to put it. Because when I say honorably, I mean not in self, self not being brought forth, but being honored by the other. And so, and you see that with the Godhead. You know, Jesus honored the Father, the Father honored the Son, the Holy Spirit honored the Son, the, the, the Father sent the Holy Spirit. There's this constant give and take flow uh, all throughout. <clears throat> all right, so, so though it was on a little bit different plane, man is actually being brought in to a relationship similar to that of the Godhead. It is not selfish, self-centered. It is not about me doing my thing or me doing something great for God. It is about oneness in the definition of what oneness is in the heart and mind of God. And I would just say this to everybody here. If you, if you have not had God define oneness to you, I would suggest you do that because um, to assume that you understand what that means I would just bet most people think in terms of a theological explanation of oneness instead of a, uh, a divine definition as not, not given by words, but as God is revealed to you. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. 
<clears throat> so this kenosis thing, how does, it, how does it have a practical application for us? Well, how we approach Christianity depends on whether we understand kenosis. Let me put it another way. Depends on whether we understand the kind of man that Jesus became and the can, kind of mankind that he became, kenosis, because that's what kind of mankind it is, and self-emptying so that it can become a vessel kind of mankind, um, as described in 2 Corinthians when he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, not of us, not, 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 not. <clears throat> um, when, if we miss that, if we don't see that, then you will, you will tend to see Jesus or his teachings in terms of him being an example, an example, okay? Um, some people see Jesus as uh, one who brought us all the right teachings and, it's, and all of the teachings are, are based on moral principles. That Jesus was a good teacher. Have you ever heard that before? But that he's the right one, I mean, he, he brought us the right teachers, the right teachings, and the right morals, and the right principles. Um, or they look at Jesus as simply a spiritual figure, and uh, as that spiritual figure, they see him as the supreme example as to how to live. Now, anybody been to church? How about Sunday school? Uh, how about this? Anybody ever heard a phrase called, what would Jesus do? You know. I mean, I've seen some people with a WW, you know, what is it, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And they didn't do anything like what Jesus would do. In fact, it, it was more like, what would Judas do? You know. <clears throat> uh, Folks, you can know exactly what Jesus would do and still not do it. Has anybody ever been in a situation where you felt, you know, you were bound by something or you this or that or whatever, and you knew what was right, you knew what you shouldn't do, but you went ahead and did it anyway, even though you knew what Jesus would do? You know, let me tell you, a bracelet with WWJD is not going to free you. Not only that, but actually knowing everything Jesus would do will not make the difference. You can copy his teachings. You can try to copy his teachings. You can copy his example or try to copy his example. But it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. Why? Because... Because the cross, when you talk about the cross in relationship to the first kind of mankind and the new mankind, the cross is God's sentence. It is his judgment on how well the first kind of man did, the first mankind. And with the cross, he said, you didn't do good at all. I'm killing all of you. I'm crucifying the old man. I'm crucifying the old mankind. You following what I'm saying here? You, you failed. You know, you didn't make a D minus. You made a big F. You failed. You totally failed. And with that, I'm giving up on the first kind of mankind. I'm going to send my son, and he's going to raise up a new man a new kind of man, a new species, and they will live as we did. They will self-empty. 
They will empty themselves of self. See, Jesus wasn't selfish, and he, he self-emptied, not because this wretched self that he had, because he was the pure, holy son of God. He did it because it's the right principle if you're going to be a man. We, we make the excuse for self-emptying or emptying ourselves of self because we're so vile on the inside. When what we're talking about here is not all about sin and wrongdoing, we're talking about how, we're talking about the, if you will, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it like this, the perfect creation. We're talking about the new creation. We're talking about the way God intended man to be. And it's not all about not having sin. It's about being a vessel of the life of Christ, period. For us, when you empty out, self-emptying, and then you get filled with Christ, it works. But Jesus emptied out, and he didn't empty out garbage and corruption. He emptied himself of his Godhead because he became a man, and the only way to truly live correctly and the only way to truly manifest the glory of God was in this way. So, Jesus came, and he was the only perfect man, and he was the only begotten son, and nobody else was of that mankind but him. He was the first, and at that point, the only of the true kind of man that had God living in him instead of him living for God. All of Israel before that time, every Israelite before that time, lived for God. Not a one of them emptied themselves out, and all sin all of them failed every one of them how where do you get that from all of sin come short of the glory of god all do okay so we do that because of our nature we do that because we're living after the old creation we're living after the old man we're living after the old species we're living after the old mankind so to to not change that to not change the old man, the, the, this kind of man we are, but to try to live for God is impossible. We can't live up to the standard of God. We, Jesus' example would kill you if you tried to live up to everything Jesus did. You can't do it. Well, we can try. Well, good. How's that working for you? Well, not too good, but at least I'm trying. See, we missed the point. So let me read a paragraph here. If the whole life and pattern of Jesus is our example, then we will all fail. The depth of how far we are from the divine pattern would cause all men to go into deep depression, <laughs> to, tr to truly comprehend how far short we have come from the glory of God. As I said, if you really want to comprehend it, look at the cross. Bam! Right there, he takes the whole first mankind and he crucifies it and he puts it away forever and he says, that's the end of it. I've had it. It's over with. Done. This is my judgment. You know, if you stand before the throne, you say, well, how'd we do in that first creation? <laughs> That, I would suggest you don't bring that up unless you bring it up in relationship to the cross, you know. And so um, it is the same as the law, except instead of copying tables of stone, we copy the incarnated Christ, meaning the only begotten son. The incarnated Christ is the only begotten son. With the, the incarnation of Jesus there is no new man. The incarnated man, Jesus Christ, is the only one, the only. Okay? Neither example, neither the tables of stone or the incarnated Christ, neither example gives us the ability to do it. All the law gives you or someone telling you to copy Jesus gives you is the command to do it. 
thou shalt not steal. I bet you nobody in this room has probably stolen since they've become a Christian. Nobody's stolen anything. Okay, well, if you did, if you break the law in one point, you've broken it all, you're all going to hell. Good luck. Unless there's another plan. Get it? Unless there's another plan. There better be another plan or we're all in trouble. You know, we are not just sailing along happily and God's covering what we've messed up. We're in big trouble if we don't comprehend kenosis and what God had in mind bringing about that kenosis. Some would, would point to the cross as eradicating the old nature, but that does not make us holy. It just makes us no longer unholy. Okay? What am, what am I trying to say there? We draw a picture of the cross on the board here. When you comprehend the cross, the death of the old man, old man, that cross has given us the death of the old man. That doesn't make you holy. It doesn't change anything. It does away with something, but it doesn't add something. Right? The whole point of the cross is not the death of the old man. That's just part of the point. The other part is there that there would be a resurrection on the other side, and that resurrection wouldn't just be Jesus out of a tomb. It would be a new man raised to the glory of God. Finally, God getting what he wants. Amen? So let me reread that. Some would point to the cross as eradicating the old nature, but that does not make us holy. It just makes us no longer unholy. Christ within is the answer. That makes you holy. Because the Bible doesn't tell you to be holy. It says be holy as he is holy. Well, you can't do that unless it's him. I mean, if it just said be holy, and that was what the folks, the old covenant did say be holy. I mean, but the new covenant for sure says be holy as he is holy. The old covenant said love love your neighbor. The new covenant says love as I have loved. Love your neighbor as yourself was the old covenant. Love as I have loved. How are you going to do that? You're not. Well, you couldn't even love, love him as yourself, much less love as Jesus loved. The proof of that is, is that people spit on him, people slapped him, people shoved the spear in his side, people mistreated the perfect son of God, incredibly mistreated him, and he loved them, and he died for every one of them, and he meant it. Now, when the last time somebody really mistreated you, talked bad about you, hurt you, did stuff to you, hurt your feelings, did you climb up on a cross, let them slap you, beat you, and everything, and say, Father, forgive them? They, they really don't know. And yet the command is, of the New Testament is, love as I have loved. That cross is a testimony of how we did in our first humanity, but it's not, that's not all. Of course we know that. It's a, it's a testimony of many things, but it is a testimony of the incredible love that is God. God is love. Not that God does, but is God. And, and should be an incredible indictment against us until we are brought to such a low place that we become obedient unto death and we embrace the cross and we embrace the kenosis and we embrace the coming forth of Christ in a real way, not in a doctrinal way, not in a teachy sort of way but in a real way. <clears throat> we all know that nobody is perfect. Amen? We always say that. Well, nobody's perfect. And that means that we cannot fully copy the character of Christ. Right. So, 
Well, let me read one more sentence here. If that is God's ultimate solution, then it is incomplete and will fail just as the law did. All right. There is there is certain people who really put a deep emphasis on following the example of Jesus. I mean, really major. Uh, anybody ever r- read the book by Sheldon called In His Steps? There you go. Uh, most people would think that the book by Thomas Akempis called The Imitation of Christ is also another one, but it's not. A lot of people stayed away from that book because they go, we don't imitate Christ, it's got to be Christ. Well, the man was talking about Christ. <clears throat> but there, is, may, there are people that would get upset with you, they have with me. This is absolute truth. When I would say stuff like Jesus is not supposed to be our example, he's supposed to be our life. And they would go, oh my God! I mean, you would be surprised how many people get upset with that. And I, it makes me wonder how true they are to trying to follow the example of Christ because if you're true enough, it, if you're really, really true with it, it won't take you long to find your total inadequacy. So apparently, some of those people are playing at it. Now people listening to this are going to hear that, and they are, they've got that viewpoint, and they're going to be all upset that I said they're playing at it. But there can be nothing else, there can be no other reason for you to hold on to that too long. Because if you truly give yourself to trying to copy Jesus, you will quickly arrive at one conclusion. Oh, wretched man that I am. When I would have done good, I ended up doing evil. When I said I won't covet, then I ended up coveting more. Anybody familiar with that? Sure, I know who's familiar with it. People that aren't trying to have, trying to copy Jesus. They're trying to get Christ formed in them. I know who understands that because they've been down that road. Because when Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, he didn't say, how shall I be delivered? He didn't say, what are the ten steps to getting me out of this mess? He said, who? And the answer was, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Oneness, not a not an copying, not an example, but oneness. <clears throat> All right, so, Brother Randy, what is the explanation of the scriptures that tell us that Jesus is our example. Well, I, apparently, based on the time that we've got right here, I'm going to have to wait till next class to really discuss that with you. But I will give you here the understanding of why that is. <clears throat> Jesus is the representative and he is the realization of all that God had in mind. Now, if I pointed at you and said, what is the definition of what I just said? That he is the representative and the realization. And I will have to tell you this. There probably will be a test. There probably will be a test. And I bet you this will be on it. You've never had a test since I've been in the Bible school here. Well, congratulations. You will have a test next week. All right. Jesus was the realization, was the representative and the realization. As the representative, he was representative of the kind of behavior, the kind of attitudes, the kind of character that the Father wanted in man. 
um, he was the only begotten son. And as such, he is our example. Okay, it's important to get this, not just for the test, but it's important to get this because I am explaining why Jesus and Jesus being an example, where that falls into and where it does not apply. Okay? When he was the only begotten son, he was the representative of all that God wanted in man. And you could see it all in him, and you could see it in no other. He lived and walked as the representative of the true character that mankind was meant to have, of the true attitudes that mankind was meant to, to carry, of the true behavior that mankind was to demonstrate. <clears throat> so he was, he was the perfect example of that. Amen? But then Jesus came as the resurrected new man. He died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. And he rose again. And when he rose again, he rose again, not alone, not single, not as the only begotten, but as the firstborn among many. And when he did that, he became not just in himself, but in and through his body, which is us, he became the realization of all that God ever wanted for mankind. The true explanation of mankind. The true definition. Not a shadow like the old covenant, like the old creation, like the first creation, but the realization in his body of the one new man and what all that he had in mind. Yes. What verse is that? It's uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Revelation 3, 14. Okay. So in this resurrected man, in this new man, in this new mankind, only in Jesus only in Jesus can we reach the potential of what God had in mind that could never be reached by Jesus of Nazareth Jesus of Nazareth the only begotten only represented it was the example of what was coming have you ever heard the, the scripture in Hebrews that says he was a forerunner as the only begotten son, he was the forerunner. In resurrection, he is not a forerunner of anything. In resurrection, we're all one with him. It all happened at once. He's not a forerunner. You have to be separate. And the whole key to oneness and the whole key to the Godhead is there is no separateness. So the forerunner is that he became the forerunner of what mankind would be like in his physical body and in resurrection would be a would be the repres not the representation but the realization of what Jesus of Nazareth was only the representative of of what the only begotten was only just a representative so, does that make sense? You know, maybe, uh, maybe drawing a picture would help too. All right, we've got, we've got the picture on the board that we've already got with a picture of a man, and that's Jesus. And inside, we put the F for the Father. And here, as a single entity, incarnated man, only begotten, he is the representative. Repre I don't know if I spelled it right or not. Probably not. He is the representative. He represents, or let's use another word. He is the example. 
example, but he's not the example to be copied. Because if you try to copy him, you're going to fail. But Jesus is our example. Next class, we'll get into what that means. I mean, this is what it means, but I'm just saying we'll get into some specifics because I think you're going to be surprised about a couple of things. So as the only begotten, as the incarnated son, as, the, as a man with, a, with his own physical body, he represented all that God wanted, but the realization of that wasn't until the resurrection. Because he didn't just want one man. You say, you know, you, you understand that he did want one man, and that one new man was Christ in his body. But my point being that he didn't just want there to be Jesus again in heaven. That's no trick. He already had that. Why die for that again? You know, I'm in heaven. I'll come down here and die. Look, I'm back in heaven. Well, why'd you even mess with coming down then? You know what I mean? I mean, you were all, had already always been up there. Now you're always going to be up there. Woo, you spent what? You know, three days and three nights. You know, wow. You know? <clears throat> no, the big trick, bada boom, bada bing, was that we <laughs> were raised up in him, one new man. And, you know, some people don't like using many-membered body, but folks, the, the New Testament uses that. Corinthians uses it. And that it is now a completely different creation from the first mankind. It is Christ in every part. It is every one of them kenosis Let this attitude, and that's the true, the, the word mind there truly is the word attitude. Let this attitude. It's not really about get this knowledge. I mean, you have to start there. But it's not about get this knowledge. It is get this attitude. Let this attitude be in every member of the body. Let every member be kenosis Okay? Why? Because Jesus, as the forerunner, did it. And this is the pattern that you're supposed to make everything according to. You don't just get saved and do stuff for God. I mean, you don't. You don't. You don't just get saved and do stuff for God. There is a plan. God has a plan. He's got a thought, you know, behind all this. And so, this man, as beautiful as he was, this, this only begotten, this incarnated man, as beautiful as Jesus was, when you read the story in the Gospels, or if you live during that day, as beautiful as Jesus is, he's only a representative of what was going to be the true realization in resurrection. Is that incredible to anybody? I remember the first time, you know, people share stuff like this, and I just go ballistic. I'm a man born in the wrong time period or something. But no, no. I mean, I know that you, many of you already know this, but do, isn't it beautiful to have, to hear it again, to hear it fresh man, and to realize the incredible reality that, I mean, I'm telling you, when I came to Jesus as a Jesus freak, to see Jesus incarnated, to see that, that only begotten son, to watch him heal, to watch him bless, to watch him do all of that, I just went, whoa, man, I can follow a guy like this. He, and I was following Jesus of Nazareth. But folks, he died and a new man arose. 
And we're not supposed to be following the guy in the Gospels. We're supposed to be following the guy in the epistles. <laughs> we're not supposed to be following the example of the guy in the Gospels. We're supposed to be manifesting the life of the guy in the epistles. Yes? And then what, what verse was that? That was Ephesians chapter 3, um, verses 9 and 10. Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. All right, let's, oh, more. All right, let's take a break.